We're going to learn how to make our applications faster and more efficient while we're building them. And what are some steps that we can do to get that done? So the first thing that we're going to look at is the data structure of our application and making sure that that's built efficiently. So I'm going to give an example of a, of an application that's for streaming. So something similar to like a Pandora website. When we're thinking about how to create the database for this Pandora style application, we want to avoid adding too many fields to a particular object because the more fields that we add to an object, the longer it's going to take the, uh, the app to load that particular object to do searches on the object. So let's, let's get some concrete examples. So imagine that we are charging a user and we're going to save that user's card information. Well, one thing that we could do is we could have in the object user, we could create a new field and call this field uh, card last four digits, for example, which would be text. And then card uh, brand name, which would be text. And we would keep going and we'd add all the information about that card underneath the user in this way. And we'd add a bunch of fields when instead it would be wiser for us uh, to add a field or add a type called card and then add the information under that. So we've created a type card, added the brand, the CVV and the last four digits, then go back to the user. And as we can see, we've referenced right here, I'll do it again, field name card of type card is created. Now uh, it's just one field and a more efficient the and this this user is going to load faster in the database the next example we're going to look at is counting objects in the database and displaying that as a statistic there's an efficient way for us to do this and a less efficient way to do this and we'll explain that through an example a few instances where we might use this is for in our situation we want to display the number of plays on a particular song and we've created this object called play because we want to know who is listening to a song so we're going to create a play whenever someone clicks on the play button after a certain amount of time elapses that to know who listened to it because if we've got this creator object we can reference and we've connected the plays and the songs let's look at the two ways that we can display the play count now First of all, we've created a list of plays underneath the song. So what we can do is we can reference the plays by saying, once we have a repeating group with the song, say current cell song plays, and then use this count function right here. So click on his uh, plays being that play object and then count the total number from that list. But when we use this count function, we have to load all of those objects and then count them. So that's gonna be slower than if we actually just had a field called play count that we are going to modify this just a number and we modify that number every time a play happens. So let's click on this play button and see what's going on here. We clicked on play, we're creating that play as we explained, and then we're making changes to a song and we're gonna add plays. Plays, we see add, result of step one to add that play. And then we're adding this count. So we've got this play count object that we created in the database. And all that was is under song, we added a field of type text called play count. This is our type number. So create a field play count. As you can see, the number is right here. I'm gonna set the default value to zero. And what we're doing is we're saying, okay, the play happened. So this song's play count, previous play count, play count plus some more and then plus click here again, one. Okay, I'm gonna delete that. And that's it, that every time that we want to show statistics, well, a lot of times when we just want to show statistics, it's more efficient for us to use this field underneath 
the particular object that just contains the number. Because now we can go back to the design in here and we can, instead of you loading all the plays, we can just say play count and that's it. And it'll display one number really fast for us. Situations where we might not use this is if we need the date information on those objects. So if we wanted to say like, well, show me the last plays that happened three months ago. Well, then we are going to have to use that count function. So that's why we have a count function because it will exist in certain situations. So um, as we can see, the play object has a has a created date and we can use that created date to do date sensitive operations. So that's when you want to use the count feature. But in this situation, but in many situations, we want to display display statistics without it. And now you know how to do that and it will be make your app faster. Let's look at another example where we can use an inefficient way to find information that we want to display on the page because we're using too many searches. We want to avoid using the do a search for action and instead reference a list underneath a data type. So we want to create lots of, of fields if we need to. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to, we're going to put this in a concrete example. So we have this connection between song and plays. So in theory, from this connection between song and plays, we can display a list of the plays. If we're in the admin panel, for example, and we want to just look at in our MP3, in our uh, streaming application, we want to say, all right, just show me all the recent plays. And when I'm looking at all the recent plays, so what I've got right here is this type of content play. And the data source, we're just going to go in and say, do a search for all the plays. Sort by created date. Descending, yes. So we're displaying all the plays. And we want to also display the song that's connected with that play. Well, we have that connection. So what we can do is we can go in here and we can say, okay, so this is where I want to display the song. So what I one way that I could find that song is I could go in here and say, I could say, do a search for a song. And then I could go in and say, well, I'll, I want to make sure that that song, that plays, and then we want to say contains current cells play. Okay. So we found that match and then we want to say first item items, song title. And now that's one way that we can display the correct song title for this play. So it's going to, it's going to be correct, but now we're loading more song information into the server. Uh, on the client side and we don't want to do that. We want to avoid that. So what we can instead do is we can go in here and have a play and we can reference backwards to that. So we can say, well, play also has a song associated with it under the play. Let's do it like this. So we'll go add a song here. And when we had this play function up here, we want to say, click on, click on play, create a new play and set a field on the play whose song is equal to current sales song, right? And now when we go back to this section where we're gonna reference the song for this play, because we got this big list of plays in our admin panel, we just wanna look at the recent activity in our app. Well, now we can go in here and delete what we just put. We just say current sales plays song and then throw in the title. That is a much, um, more, uh, much faster and more simple way to reference the song in this particular example. Also don't want to put too many elements on one page of your application. If you find yourself adding in this example, we have, this is, uh, I don't even, I'm not going to count the number of pop-ups here, but it's almost 13 or 14 pop-ups. And in just looking here in the elements tree, and if we go down here into this group company details, we can see all these groups that have different stuff associated with them. And, uh, a better way for us to structure this to have these different pages that the the admin would visit in this example and that way those individual pages would load faster because the more elements you have the more memory that the the your client or the users that's checking out your app is going to need on their computer to load that page and it can make the load time slower the final speed optimization tip that we're going to talk about is using API workflows. When we use an API workflow, instead of having a giant 
workflow that's 11 steps or 12 steps long in this example for for a trigger like clicking on a button or other triggers that we have on an individual page on the website, we can instead move some of these actions into an API workflow. And this is gonna distribute the load. So another server is gonna be executing some of these steps. So one, once one part of the server is gonna be executing these steps, another part of the server is gonna be executing the steps on the API workflow. Essentially, we're distributing load. And now I'm gonna explain how we can set up an API workflow so that you guys have a practical way to do it in your app. And when we're looking at steps that are seven steps, eight steps or more, that's a good, good indication that you may be able to use an API workflow to minimize the, the amount of time that it will take to run those actions as well, because you'll wanna know how to do that if you're gonna use that tip. First of all, you wanna go and click in your API and make sure that your, your app exposes a workflow API as mentioned right here. You wanna click, so you wanna click this app exposes the API workflow uh, and then you're gonna get access. You can leave the data API alone then you're gonna access the backend workflows all the way down here on the bottom. So you wanna to go to backend workflows. And in the example we have, we're, we're modifying the user in multiple steps. So we're going to need to collect the information from that particular part of the site um, because the backend workflows aren't created on any particular page. They're on their own section, right? So we need, to, we need a way to take the information on that page and ensure that it gets to this section of the site. And then we also need to create the, the workflow. So let's look here. It's a little confusing when they say add an endpoint, but basically it's when you wanna click on add an endpoint, new API endpoint, just call it that. And this is basically like create a new API work, create a new uh, workflow that you can run multiple times. So in different locations of the site. And so, so here we'll say configure user settings. That'll be our example. We have this other one that I've created. I'm just going to delete that. Uh, and the way we're going to get the data from any page on our site to this uh, this workflow that we're, that we're setting up is to specify what we want to pass in the information. So we'll have we'll create a key. So you see, we add a new parameter, define the key, and the key is just the name of the data that you're going to send. In this situation. Uh, we want the user because we're going to modify the user that signed up. So we've got a user of type user, whoops, of type user, delete that. Now, when we go into click here to add an action and we want to make some changes to that user, we can click here and we can see that the user, this is the key that we created, right? So that that's just the name that we decided as arbitrary it's for our own reference user. So user is right here. So now we can modify the user. We could go in and say, I want to change their about me to da 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 or whatever you want to do to that particular user. You can now do in these steps instead. And now let's go back to that sign up workflow and we'll create that, that, uh, workflow in here. So this additional API step. So we would delete a bunch of these actions that are happening on one big step. And we would say, click here to add an action, custom events, schedule API workflow. API workflow, now we figure out what it, what did we name our workflow? In this case, we call it configure user settings. And the schedule date, we're gonna, we can schedule these events in the future, but we're gonna run this right now. So current dates this time, and the, the information that we're gonna send is the current user. We wanna modify the current user that just signed up but you can modify other information you want. Uh, and I'm just gonna ignore the privacy rules uh, cause they could interfere with the application. And uh, this isn't a big security issue on uh, a lot of examples when we're just building an MVP. Uh, we can cover that more later if you guys wanna talk about security uh, issues in your apps. So there we go. Now we have one action and we got rid of all these extra actions. So it's the entire step is going to be faster the entire action one more bonus tip is the data privacy section of your application 
This is important for security purposes uh, as well as for making your app fast because when you create privacy rules around a particular object in your database, then it won't load uh, with the rest of the app when the user that is visiting your website doesn't have permission to see it. So how do we get into the privacy section? Well, you wanna to go to the data section of the bubble editor and then go into privacy. We've got this area where we can define different rules. So I will just use the user as, well, let's, let's use, let me create something that's kind of confident. Well, we already have it, a card, right? So let's say, let's define a new rule and we'll call this role card owner. Then we'll go in and say, when this card's creator is current user, they'll be able to find, they'll be able to view all the fields, find and searches who attach fields and other things like that. And when we are removing these actions, like find this in the searches, it's gonna speed up those searches if a, a particular user doesn't need to see that information. That concludes all the tips for speeding up your application. If you put all these into practice, your app will be faster and your users will be happy as well. Strongly encourage you to check out our website at newagedevelopment.bubbleapps.io. The link will be down below this video. And create an account on our website. You can access our private forum where we regularly visit to answer questions about bubble development to help you get unstuck if you get stuck and you have a bug in your website or your app or if you're looking for advice on getting clients as a web developer, we also talk about that. Uh, anything related to bubble development, you'll find in there. And the goal of this website is to turn you into an expert uh, and give you the tools that you need and the skills to be able to build any kind of website or application that you want uh, online and uh, be able to, you can unleash your creativity online. That's our goal. So definitely wanna see you there. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. See you in the next video, guys.